taught you to hate the color of your skin? Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the shape of your nose and the shape of your lips? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? Who taught you to hate the race that you belong to? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. No, before you come asking Mr. Muhammad, does he teach hate? You should ask yourself, who taught you to hate being what God gave you? Most of us blacks, or Negroes as he called us, really thought we were free without being aware that in our subconscious, all those chains we thought had been struck off were still there. And there were many ways where what really motivated us, motivated us was our desire to be loved by the white man. Malcolm meant to lance that sense of inferiority. He knew it would be painful. He knew that people could kill you because of it, but he dared to take that risk. He was saying something over and above that of any other leader of that day. While the other leaders were begging for entry into the house of their oppressor, he was telling you to build your own house. Build your own house. Look, Welcome to the Gilchrist Experience. It's always looking at the mind. Um, Today's guest, uh, Aisha Shakur of uh, Street Corners Resources, and of course, co-host uh, Graham Weatherspoon. Now, we watch this old piece I used to run all the time, and it's, that's going back 50 years, man. And uh, it still pertains to what's happening today. Uh, we still have that lack of self-esteem, and we sort of put each other down, and, and we have all these gang wars still, and. I remember we used to gang wars back in those days. You know, we have uh, this Graham uh, Grant housing in Manhattanville. Aisha, uh, welcome to the show. Um, make a few comments on how it was back in the day. Now, 50 years we go back with Malcolm, now up to date today, and it's still, still the same, isn't it? Well, I think that, um, one, thank you for having me. Uh, I think that it has progressed. It's Got very worse. different from very different from back in the day, okay. including the Gang Abatement Act that was used back then to make major arrests has uh, changed to include social media, the use of cellular phones, okay. the use use of uh, gathering with uh, people who are formally convicted. Uh, it just incorporates a, a wealth of things that were not there before, and you know, of course, we didn't have mm -hmm. social media back in the day. Thank you ago and now uh, a lot of the gangs are using social media to engage in violent activity and so that brings mm -hmm. us to the takedown that we uh, just witnessed right. in our community 103 young people uh, right. a lot of uh, the, the a, a big way that those young people became incorporated into that takedown was had a lot to do with social media mm -hmm. the use of the cell phone and of course the gang abatement act was uh, in full play meaning that whatever they could use from that to pick people up, they did. Or, okay. uh, you, you know, along the way in the investigation, as they found certain things, those things were incorporated so that they would ensure that they had enough to pick up young people. So you mean what they said on Facebook was used against them? Yeah. Now, I know that our district attorney, Cy Vance, uh, he issued a statement, and he said it wasn't because of what was yeah, said on, on said Facebook that, yeah. right. uh, that, that led to the arrest. But what we do know is that a lot of what young people have been saying and doing on Facebook has been uh, a cause for investigation, cause uh, to at least people pick people up to find out what they knew, uh, cause to say that they had some association and affiliation, and, all, and right, they right, incorporated right. that with right. other things to, to make sure that they had enough charge. So um, while I, I understand what the uh, district attorney is saying, that that's not the entire reason. Believe me, social okay. media pay, played a major mm -hmm. part in that takedown and the conspiracy charges, most of them are connected to the use of social media and right. cell phones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, our, our young people and parents need to 
we were saying earlier, they need to wake up and smell the coffee. Um, the use of a cell phone, mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram, all these other technical um, genres that are being used, uh, especially for the conspiracy. Conspiracy was always a difficult charge to place on somebody. Mm, because right. you had to somebody have to have somebody literally there when the plot was being developed. Mm. Mm. Conspiracy, easiest thing to prove with social media. Because people are sending messages yeah. back and forth yeah. Yeah. and over a period of time. Mm. Yeah. I always tell kids that in the police department what we do what we do in the police department is what they should be doing in school. Mm. Gathering intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's what we do. Now, everybody heard about the thing with the NSA and President Obama and the people don't want the, the, the government prying in and looking. Well, this gives them reason to pry and look. We probable fail, cause. Prob and probable cause. We yeah. fail to understand that we're opening a door. Right. We're opening the door to allow them to come in and do what they're doing. Yeah. Because now they can say they're justified in doing what they're doing. Mm. Because this is the medium that the young people are using to work as a network together to perpetrate crimes against the general public. Another thing they need to understand is that gangs, gangs are looked at as domestic terrorism. Mm. You don't have to be a Taliban member to be under the watchful eye of the federal government. If you're involved in a gang that is an organized network of individuals mm -hmm. conspiring to do and commit one act or another against society, against an individual, you will be monitored. And there is no way that they will not attempt to monitor you. So what the police department does, they get resources from the federal government, mm. right? right. Okay. And those resources are being used domestically to monitor kids such as the kids that were taken mm. down here in Harlem last week. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not want the prying eyes on you, but there needs to be a prying eye. When our children are seeking to engage in, in violent acts, what are our, our elders to do? What are other kids to do when there is a plan afoot? Whether it's to sell drugs or to commit an act of violence, that young man that did the slaughter out, out west that sat in his car, and we played that last week, <laughs> making that <laughs> he video. Made video. Okay? Yeah, he made a video about it. So wow. he made the video, yeah. and it alerted people to the fact that he was about to do That's something. That's right. Wow. That's, right. That's no different than what we have here That's on right. the East Coast with, with the young kids in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And so did uh, the couple that uh, shot the two policemen. They made a yeah. video before yeah. that. Before. So that's why they should be watching this stuff. See, and another thing is this. Way back in the day, um, yeah. if you got arrested, mm -hmm. we ran your, every, every arrest on you, we ran it. And mm -hmm. we still, they still do. Mm -hmm. If you were arrested with a, a buddy, a cohort, we then start drawing a, a flow tool. chart. Mm -hmm. We got you and we got Winston. Right. Now, Winston may have gotten arrested three times with seven other people. Mm -hmm. So the possibility is you might know one of those seven. Mm. Associates. Known associates. Mm -hmm. And that's how we fan out and we start picking up people mm. because there is a common thread running sure. between the people. Mm. That's how you can pick up 103 people. They live in the same building. Wow. Right? In the same <laughs> complex. 35, yeah. over 35 years ago, I executed warrants in three counties in Manhattan, <laughs> Brooklyn, and Queens. No, Manhattan, yeah, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan simultaneously mm. on the same day. And we picked up 15 people wow. at the same time. And I'm talking 35 years ago. Trust mm. me, these young people mm. are no match for the technology that we have now because you're used, you, can't, you can't engage in technology mm. to commit a criminal act. Mm. 
And there is no reason to be engaging in this behavior. Mm. It, there's, there's no justification for it. Yeah, this, this particular case, uh, let's get to a, the root of the problem here. Uh, you got kids living across the street from one another. Mm -hmm. They really don't have any basic beef about drug territory or it's just uh, I don't like you because you live across the street, more or less. And one of the biggest victims of this was a basketball player. I'll touch on uh, Chicken Murphy, the daughter of uh, Talon Murphy, mm. right. who has uh, been doing some activism in that area uh, and some organizing, uh, trying to get young people uh, to stop shooting and uh, create some harmony in that area of the community. We have a piece on her, so would you play that piece on on the basketball player, Tanya? To Tanya? To Shana. To Shana. The legend, man. To the killer, man. I They're going to catch you, boy. They're going to catch you. I'm telling you. She ain't deserve this. You. She did not deserve this. You can't tell me nothing. 18 years young. They lovingly called her chicken. Bop on her step. That's why they call her chicken. A little bow legged. 18 year old Tayshana Murphy. She was a rising basketball star until her brutal murder Sunday. She was shot in the chest, the hip, and the hand while trying to protect her little brother, Bam Bam. She was very loyal. Like, if you was her friend, she always had your back no matter what problem. If you was arguing with somebody, she was always there for you. Reports indicate that Bam Bam was mixed up in a violent feud between the people from Grant House and the Manhattanville Projects. When the two suspects couldn't find him, they took their anger out on Chicken. That's according to her cousin, Pierre Walton. It wasn't no drama. She was never into no extra. Sh she just wanted to, she just wanted to live life. Like, that was her. Outside the building where she lived, candles lit the floor and a box of chicken. It's really it's hurtful to know that you would it, take an innocent person's life and just like think that it's a piece of trash to throw it away. She, like basketball was her life. The talented star was ranked by ESPN as the nation's 16th best point guard in her class. But the gifted athlete also had a record. Two previous arrests that were sealed and another for third degree assault. Despite the runnings with the law, number 15 had a bright future. She wanted to land a college scholarship and play pro basketball. Chicken's girlfriend Tay was too emotional to speak. She just held a memento of them together. Police have yet to locate and arrest the suspects. If you have any information, please dial 1-800-577-TIPS. This is Maria Sandoval for the New York Post. Mm. Now you see, the, you have all these tragic cases where, you know, an up-and-coming star trying to protect the little brother who got involved with this rivalry between Manhattanville and Grant Housing. Well, actually, they were out uh, around 5 o'clock in the morning, 4, 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, just kind of hanging out in front of the building. And Tashana Chicken uh, decided it was kind of cool and she wanted to go upstairs and get a jacket. She went upstairs to get like a sweat hoodie or something. And I think that she said to her mom, her mom said, why don't you just stay up? And she said, no, I'm going back down. What happened was, uh, as she came back down, as soon as she came back down, uh, Manhattanville was you know, people from Manhattanville uh, chased them into the building. And evidently, from what I understand from the story, is that she went, they all went different ways and she went on a different staircase. And uh, her killer met her on the fourth floor landing, not too far uh, from where, um, it's not where her mother, her, I think her mother was on the 15th floor, it was another friend. But people heard them, and she heard her pleading for her life. So people have to understand that this killer killed her in a way that was really, really horrible. And she was pleading for her life. And when myself, when I arrived, and uh, Jackie Rowe Adams, we uh, responded uh, after the body had been, um, her body had been moved. But you could still see the imprint of her body plastered in blood. So. It was as if someone had taken red paint and just it traced where her body had been. And you could see that she, it looked like she may have had her arm up like this. And she was shot in her arm and shot in her chest. And I think the shot in her chest is what took her life. But you can see that imprint up against the wall on the fourth floor landing. And as I looked at that imprint and I said, you know, this is all over foolishness. This is foolishness. This is not something that had to be resolved 
by taking her life. And uh, later that day, you saw young people uh, trying to hold on to what they could. It wasn't even really later. It was like, you know, maybe 30 minutes. I noticed that uh, people had on shirts with blood on it, including her mom, with her blood. Like they had actually taken her blood and put it on the shirt as a way to just try to hold on to something. Like this was her blood. This was her life. You know, blood mm -hmm. is seen as life. And it's just so sad that, you know, she had to die that way. And people heard her. They could hear her. Other people were in the staircase. People were behind uh, closed doors in, in you know, the protection of their home. They couldn't open up their door. Uh, and they heard her plea for her life. And they heard her with her last words. And she was just saying, please, please don't shoot me. And um, young people continue to beef even over this, uh, over her death. And uh, sure. supposedly the death of Walter, Walter Reck. Uh, Sumter, um, his death was supposedly in to avenge the death of Chicken. Now I don't know I any of that yeah. to be true. Okay. Uh, but that's what what the story is. Mm -hmm. um, I was over in Grant and Manhattanville both yesterday, mm -hmm. um, and it's just really a, a somber, sad feeling. People are remembering the death of uh, Tashana Chicken Murphy. They're remembering. Uh, on the Manhattanville side, the, the death of uh, Walter Reck Sumter. So it's like both have a, have a loss, and neither housing development has a gain. There's mm -hmm. no gain. The recreation centers are still not providing the kind of resources that they used to provide before when the centers would be open and uh, flourishing with all different kinds of activities and the elders from the community in the same space with the youth. That's, it's not that, that way. Uh, we, I visited uh, Manhattanville, and I noticed that there's a community-based organization that has the entire run of the center, which I thought was a little strange, and I heard that people are protesting that. And there are, while there are some free activities, it's clear that it's not an open-door policy anywhere young people can well, come in to, like the days of old, you know? Yeah, you know, we have a Boys and Girls Club of Harlem there. That's right, can't wait till which the doors we have open. to introduce you to the director there okay. and see if we can improve. It's some. currently open. Yeah. It's okay. Currently open. Right. We're dealing from 14 to 18. Okay. I think so um, our kids need to understand that they have something to contribute mm -hmm. to society. It takes time to do it. But look at it this way. Let's say that Dr. Ben Carson was a gangbanger back in the day, and he got killed. Where would that leave the people whose lives he saved as a brain surgeon? Oh, absolutely. You know, mm. we, we need to see value in ourselves as individuals first. You, you have to see some worth in yourself. You need to see worth in another human being, and there is worth in everybody. Mm -hmm. The person that you're going up against to shoot over stupidity and for really nothing mm. might be the very person you would have needed five or ten years down the road to help you in a critical situation. Oh, absolutely. None of us know between the ages of 16 and 35 or 40 where we're really going. You know, mm -hmm. it, whatever some, if somebody asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You may have said one thing or the other, but as time progressed, you became something else. But if your life was wasted and thrown away the way our young people are throwing away their lives, you cannot make a contribution at all. Mm -hmm. Not even to your family, let alone to your community. Mm -hmm. And there is something that, you know, we, we really need to see self-worth. Going back, I've always said this, if you don't have a respect for God, you're not going to have a respect for another human being, mm. let alone yourself. And parents need to get beyond the stupidity because we know what worked 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And what worked 50 years ago will work again if you go back to what worked 50 years ago. Parents need to start parenting. Mm. I've talked to a lot of parents. 
They've been in my office. Well, I'm afraid of my son. Mm. You're afraid of your son. Well, because they don't know who he is. He's been raising himself a lot. Well, a lot true. Time. Because if you're afraid of your child, you weren't raising your child. Exactly. And you had no business bringing a child into the world mm -hmm. because you, you, you shouldn't have brought him here and you weren't prepared to raise the child. Exactly. But uh, you can't, you a, know. Parent, a parent needs to mm -hmm. keep a check on their child. I don't, I don't care about ACS and all this stupidness about you can't do this. You are responsible for your child because if the courts or ACS is going to step in, it's not going to be of any benefit to your child. Mm -hmm. You need to know where your child is. Your child should be home at a specific time, and they need to understand it's not about them picking up the phone and calling, well, my mother did this to me, blah, blah. Well, if it's that way, <coughs> then you need to leave and go live wherever they're going to put you. You go there different time hey, now. Let me tell you something. It's a different time. If you're dumb enough to believe that it's a different time, it no, is a different time. Not, but not. if you're dumb enough to think that a child should be running your house because There's society so says, there, no, no, There's let me so tell you, Winston. You can be hard on them if you want. You can be, you can, yeah. you need to be <coughs> st stern and consistent with what you're presenting to a child. Well, when, when you tell a child it's no, it's no. A 15 year old doesn't run a house. 15-year-old doesn't have a job, can't pay rent, can't sign a contract. The only thing they need to do is go to school, <coughs> study, and prepare themselves for a later moment in life. But parents need to parent. They're not. Another thing, your kids are coming home with things that don't even belong to them, and you don't question it. No, you don't bring Johnny's jacket in my house. Johnny's jacket <coughs> belongs on Johnny's back. Yeah, get some water. And Johnny's jacket should be in his house. We don't check book bags. Mm -hmm. Kids are bringing things. All these kids are running around with guns. Where do you think they're storing them? Hey. They've, they've got these guns. The parents are not checking their bags. They're not checking their room. Forget about this stuff about my right to privacy. It's not your apartment. You don't have privacy in somebody else's apartment. All right? Parents need to step up, check their sons and their daughters. A lot of times girls are carrying guns and moving guns for the guys because they know there's less chance that they will be stopped and checked. Yeah. And a lot of girls now are even involved in the gun trafficking. And another thing with, with regard to gun trafficking, all these guns, we know the guns are coming in from other states. And people are being monitored in the trafficking from state to state. So this becomes a federal issue because if you're caught with a gun that's stolen from another city, you got a problem because it's interstate trafficking. So you're going to have to answer questions not only to the police, but you're going to have to answer questions to federal agents. Mm -hmm. I mean, all that's well and good, but um, you have to have some sympathy for these, these parents out here who who are trying their best and they still can't keep their kids in line because of these gangs. I mean, a lot of these uh, women out here don't have the resources or the way of it all. They're trying to be good parents, but they don't know how to be parents, a lot of them. A lot of these young kids out here had babies rather than aborting. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, more sympathetic than you are, but uh, it, it's pathetic, really. I mean, it's... Of course they should be good parents, especially when you see an organization like ACS and what they do. I mean, that's, I think about ACS and it, it's pathetic. Uh, um, they get hold of children and they ruin out children. It's planned genocide. I mean, there's so many things out here uh, that are here because of the planned genocide. And we as black people don't even understand it half the time. I mean, in the 1980s when crack came in, that was planned genocide, the way they ripped up Harlem and just poured the, pour, pour, they just uh, ran amok with the poison that they had polluted Harlem with, this crack. And these are the, this is the results today are parents of the crack generation. A lot of these parents weren't crack. It affected well, a lot of us. We go back crack. to 1980, when this whole thing really started, when the Republicans first took over. And it, it was just polluted with, with crack. And this is the end result of the kids that are parents, children of the parents of the crack era.
What we're seeing. They didn't have that stability that we can talk about in our era, where we knew about parenting and knew about being stern on your kid. Like my father. Psh, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> if, if See? It, yeah, if and it, wasn't, it got, wasn't about you calling ACS. Oh, it wasn't about you calling BCWS. It was back, back in the day. Back you knew your black mm -hmm. behind was out of line, <laughs> and you sat your black behind in the chair, <laughs> and, and you, you did what you were told. The punishment was. All right? It's all he had to do. He didn't have to say nothing to me. He just looked at me. That, too. And I say, how high do you want me to jump? That's right. And this is one of the toughest men I ever met in my life. And he, he took no mess. You had your father. My father died when I was four. Yeah. My mother was five feet tall, all right? I had to take her off of a dude in a gas station because she was whipping <laughs> a dude in the gas station. <laughs> I saw my mother punch a detective in his mouth from the 75th precinct when he kicked me one day, mm. okay? Mm. It's not about That's old school. just because you don't have your father. Yeah. Right now, moms need to step up, need to step up. Oh, if, if, if you got to stand on a chair with a frying pan, stand on the chair with the mm. frying pan. But that, that, that guy needs to understand that you're the mother, he's the child. Mm. And you're not going to operate in and out of my house in any old manner. There has to be a standard set in the home. Yeah. And if, if the child, I told my son, well, he, he got a little smart once, I think if you think you're going to pick up the phone and call somebody, you're leaving here butt naked because you yeah. don't own a thing. Everything you got, I bought. It's mine. Right, so you, if you think that, if you ever think to pick up the phone, make sure you're on a pay phone because you'll never show you're behind in this house again. Well, now, he find, never thought about leaving. You find that most of, the, most of the kids that have parents like that don't get in trouble. They got better sense to. No, I was more afraid of my father than I was the police. Mm. You know, I, I had no fear of police. I mean, not as much as I did of my father. So I didn't think about getting in trouble. Same so I had to go home and speak to him. Well, you know, speaking of parents, there was a story that came out following the story uh, regarding the takedown, DNA Info, mm -hmm. uh, which is an online uh, news reporting agency, right. uh, reported that uh, this woman, I think the last name is Fort, who lives in uh, one of the housing developments, her son had been caught with a 357 Magnum early on, like maybe a year or so ago or what have you. And was already on probation or whatever. And she was one of the mothers who was saying, you know, why did they come and get my son? Why did they come and get him early in the morning? Mm -hmm. And what a lot of parents fail to realize is that, you know, you have to really stay on top of your child. Just because your child says, oh, I'm not hanging out with the same people. I'm not doing the same thing. I've had it. Uh, they don't always stick to that. They usually go back to what they know mm -hmm. and go back to those areas and hanging around with those same people. And case in point, yesterday I was in uh, uh, Manhattan, I think it was while we were in, the, we were in the Grant, and there was a young man who was Where identified <laughs> as having been one of the young men who was picked up, and he had gotten released. And he was uh, the woman who heads up the uh, housing development said, but he's right back out here with the same people. We saw him, he came out of the building, he was treated you know, with a little celebrity, so to speak, Hey, yo, what's up? Everybody was happy to see him. They know that he had gotten freed, and these were the same people that he had been hanging out with. So what the woman and I were talking about was if he, if, if, it, if it were my son and he was just coming home from something like that, he wouldn't even be back right. outside. He'd be in the house. Right. He'd be in the house. That would have to cool down. That would have to, you know, he would have to start making a plan to do something different, and I think a big part mm -hmm. of why young people are caught up in this vicious cycle and kind of a roller coaster of violence and mm -hmm. deviant kinds of behavior, and not all of them. You know, no. we, want, we want to be careful. I don't want to criminalize uh, our, all of our young people or paint them all with one brush. But the young people who are involved in gang activity and uh, violent behavior have, become, have gotten caught up in a cycle, so to speak. They get known for what they do, their reputation, uh, their definition of who they are is through what they have been doing, the crimes that they have been committing, the people that they have uh, been able to intimidate, and uh, the lines that they have been able to establish in the community and define as theirs. And so unless we intervene as a community, people intervene, the parents intervene, mm -hmm. um, community leaders 
and our religious leaders intervene, we're going to really see more and more of our young people mm -hmm. uh, go towards the way of incarceration or death. And mm -hmm. it, right now we're losing large numbers to the grave and large numbers to the uh, prison system. system. For the last, I think it's six yeah, years, Cy Vance has done, Cy Vance, the district attorney, has been doing these takedowns. And the takedowns have yielded not as many as 103, but I remember there were 60, 50, 40, you know. Mm -hmm. So the numbers were a quantity, but when you think about a place like Harlem, and it's that number of young people, you know, close to 100 every time, or 50, that's a lot of young people that will be missing from our community. And Let, um, Let's go to the videotape. Um, of the takedown, and then we can talk a little bit about it, well, you know, what happened. Uh, let's go to the videotape, and we'll come right back at you. Maybe we'll run half of it, about five minutes long. All right. Breaking news this morning, there's been a major gang round up by the NYPD. Uh, all kinds of takedowns all over town. Let's go to uh, Lisa Evers. She's got a tip about this almost before it happened, or even before it happened. Lisa, what's happening? Well, Greg and Rosanna, we're here in Harlem at the scene of one of the biggest NYPD gang takedowns ever. It started very early this morning here at the Manhattanville houses and also a couple blocks away at the Grant houses. Let me show you some of the video that we captured here as police were taking out what they are telling us are some of the most dangerous gang members in the city. One of the suspects was from what's called the Stack 3 gang. And as he was led in handcuffs into the police van, he yelled out, Happy Stack Day, still defiant. Now, now, residents here in these housing developments have been terrorized by these gangs, have been experienced a number, a number of shootings and other types of crime, including drug dealing and weapons possession that have been going on here for quite some time. Now, what we're hearing is from the Manhattan DA's office, more than 100 suspects are being indicted today, and this is one of the largest numbers of gangs that they've taken down. It's part of what's called Operation Crew Cut. This was begun under Commissioner Kelly back in 2010, working with the Manhattan Manhattan DA and these gang members were basically, according to authorities, acting as if they had total impunity to do their dirty business and put it out on Facebook and other social media outlets. And they were bragging about it, not realizing that law enforcement was hip to them. They had developed codes that were so sophisticated that the DA's office had to actually come up with almost a textbook of code language to explain to prosecutors and police what they were talking about when they were making threats against rival gang members and also uh, threatening to do other things in the community that uh, many people here were very, very upset by. So a major bust this, this early this morning took place here at the Grand Houses. We're also hearing from sources that one of the suspects who was picked up might have been connected with the murder of that high school aspiring female high school basketball player a couple of years ago, the one who had won a Division I scholarship and was on her way to a female basketball star career. So there's a lot to this case, and uh, investigators feeling very sad satisfied with what happened this morning. They also picked up some other people not necessarily involved with these cases who had outstanding warrants because what we've learned from being out here this morning is they have hand scanners, portable hand scanners, almost like mini iPads that they can take, scan people as they're doing these raids and picking up other people who are wanted for outstanding uh, violations and other outstanding crimes. So a very busy morning here. More than 400 police officers, very specialized units from the NYPD, the gang unit off on it. The OCCB, the Organized Crime Control Bureau, Narcotics Division, and also the Public Housing Police, who are very familiar with many of these suspects and have been aware of their activities. So what they're calling a successful operation, there'll be many more details on this later on this afternoon at police headquarters at 2 o'clock, where Police Commissioner Bratton, as well as Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance, will be holding a news conference to explain the full total effect of what happened today and also where these indictments are going. But the police and the Prosecutors are sending a very clear message to these gang members who are trying to spread their name and spread terror through social media and also to the hardworking people who live in these developments that this will not be tolerated. And no matter how much code they throw around, they're going to crack it and they're going to get them. That's the message they're sending out here today. We're live in Harlem. I'm Lisa Evers, Fox 5 News. Rowan Greg, back to you. Lisa, great school. The cops are on top of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, walking around with little scanners and this, I guess, this is our new uh, police commissioner, Bratton, new showing technology. his showing his muscle, huh? Uh, they, well, they're quite they proud of this. Huh? Let me let me tell you something. You know, 
everybody thinks that technology just came about. Yeah. 1978, I'm on a special assignment in one of the district attorney's offices in New York City. The guy's in the office, he has a little camera with a lens about that long, and he points it out the window. He says, find the building that is on the screen. So he's aiming it, we're looking at the screen, and he pans out. And we're literally watching a guy at a urinal in a bathroom. Mm. The building was four miles away. Wow. Four miles away. And that was, and that was in 1978. What wow. do you think? Damn. Oh. Wow. What do you people listening today think that you know about technology? Yeah. You don't know about technology. No. We had a van put together which we could park anywhere in the black of night in a blackout. We could park it and videotape everyone and everything moving and pick up your voice from over 200 feet away. And in that night vision. Back then. 1970, 19, that was around 1982. No, 82, 85. And then we could film in total darkness and the video was as clear as what you're seeing right here in wow. front of you. We could roll that video, freeze frame and print out a photograph. Back then. Wow. So, so when, when guys, and this, this is a, when you have people terrorizing your building, and we've seen this in the movies, but this is real. When you have people terrorizing your building, you've got criminals living in your building, you have children growing up in the building. Mm -hmm. You don't want your child victimized by them, nor drawn into the madness. And public housing has been a place where criminals have fested for years. There was a time you couldn't stay in public housing if you got arrested. That's right. You could not stay. You couldn't walk on the grass. You could not stay. You were evicted. All right? We did one building, another piece of technology from the 80s. Because mm. what I'm telling you is old stuff. I'm not telling you the new stuff. We have a computer. We type in the address. That computer will tell us the name of every person living in that building that's ever been arrested. We took one building, 1290 Sutter Avenue, East New York, 75th Precinct, the Cypress Hills Project. A five-story building, 300 felony arrests attributed to the occupants of that one building. Mm -hmm. 300 arrests attributed to the occupants of one five-story building. Wow. That is a crime wave in public housing. That's one building out of about 18 buildings in that development. And that's what we're still seeing. You're seeing it. Yeah, and probably the, the so amount of felonies. So one increased. of the things the city said what about was what's happening now? to bring down crime, what about the, what's city happening wants, now? the city wants to get rid of public housing. People say, oh, they can't do it. People downtown on Myrtle Avenue and Brooklyn, they can't. I said, what do you own? You don't own anything they don't own here. It. They can do whatever they it's want. It's the cities. They can sell it because they're losing money. And Donald you're, Trump you're, is you're on, you're on public assistance. <laughs> you're on food stamps. You're on, you're on Medicaid, and you're contributing nothing. And your kids are running amok. They're in and out of Rikers Island. So what the city said, we're going to sell these problem housing projects. We're going to sell them. We're going to let you know that you have three years to be able to purchase this apartment because we're selling the property. So the city is divesting themselves of the property. They give a tax abatement to the new owner. They don't pay taxes for 15 years. Wow. And you now have to be able to purchase that apartment. That's if you're gang banging and running around doing craziness, mm -hmm. you can't buy the apartment even if you have cash because you don't work anywhere. You're out. Now what makes you think you're staying? Because who runs the courts? Who runs housing court? Mm. The city of New York. So you were notified three years prior, you have to have your act together in order to buy the apartment to stay here. Ergo, you go down the Myrtle Avenue, downtown Brooklyn, those buildings have been wiped clean. All mm -hmm. the undesirables are gone. They so have that's the, the future of Manhattanville and Where Grand Housing. Is that your, you seem to be setting up the future for Manhattanville and Grand Housing if the parents don't get their act together. Well, that's huh? what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And that's, right. that's property 
that is very desirable. Choice property. Just yeah. walking through that area yesterday evening and looking at all the new developments and all of the new businesses that are down near uh, the river's edge, right. Uh, right off of 125th Street mm -hmm. on the side of the highway. Right. There are uh, a plethora of uh, restaurants and shop, mm -hmm. uh, uh, places yeah. to shop. And then there's a new development, a, a huge building. That's just going up. That yeah. are going up, and it has ah. all to do with technology. Ah. And so I'm sure they a developer would themselves. love that property. Of uh, course. The Manhattanville and the Grant, because yeah. both sit close to this whole new technological center that's coming. I'm hoping that that's not the case. No, but, but I but think one of the no, things we do no, is we no, leave that, our community that's, unprotected. That's, that's, a, you know? that's really just a plan right there. So all these 103 people that were picked up, wherever they were living in the building, uh, like Graham says, that could be part of the scheme of the city to rid them of this um, plague. Well, <laughs> one one of the things is is that no. the uh, once they're if they're convicted, uh, their families could be asked to leave public housing. Right. And if you have that's a firearm too, if you're arrested with a firearm, right, you're up for eviction. So that's the residual effect of this mm -hmm. whole gang gang banging thing. You wow, know. Wow, uh, wow, I, wow! I think too the other. That's the one way to clean up the the project. Decent isn't it? people yeah. have mm. the right to live in peace. Mm -hmm. Really. Really. And, and I'm really concerned, uh -huh. it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Because we have young people going down the tube to oblivion. Mm. What do we do and, about and it? The other, I mean, it other seems a little spectrum. late to talk about that, but. Uh, it's, not, it's never too late. Um, okay. The thing that lets me know that it's not too late to have right. the conversation of what to do okay. is when uh, I, I observe the young people yesterday evening, the younger brothers and sisters, uh, the younger people who, who have been watching these guys and kind of um, glorify these guys. There was one mm -hmm. young kid that was over near the basketball court and we were talking to some young people and this kid said, so I said, have, have they ever asked you to join a gang? And he said, well, no, but they asked me where I'm going and who I'm with. And I said, well, who do you say you're with? And he listed like a whole list of the names of the people that got arrested. I said, well, who are they? He said, well, they were all picked up, but they belong to in whatever gang. And so he knew the proper things to say mm -hmm. uh, if he were stopped. He was 10. 10 years old. Right, but you know also 10-year-olds were being recruited to hold guns and right. drugs oh, this is and real. that kind this of thing. So heavy. these are the kids who are watching, and, and they know all of that because they're watching it. So how many of these parents you think are strong enough to tell their kids, or as Graham alluded to, uh, uh, don't really do their job as parents? How many of these parents do you think are actually part of this? I think that the parents are overwhelmed. Okay. Uh, what, what I saw yesterday and even at other times is that the parents are very young. So yeah. you might have uh, a 15-year-old whose mom it has not cleared 28 yet. Okay. So they're growing you know? up together. Right, they're growing children, up together. A lot of the children having children. Right, and they right. like a lot of the same things. They think the same way. So the, the the guidance that would come for a younger person is needed for both the mother and the child. Right. And that's not all. You know, I, I really want to be careful about not pl uh, criminalizing or painting everyone there with the same brush. But there's a lot going on that needs to be um, addressed. And one is the parental issues and uh, dealing with parents who are overwhelmed, parents who don't have enough resources, yeah. parents who feel like uh, they don't want to stop their young person from doing what they do because they feel like their child is in jeopardy every day, having to navigate a community that is filled with violence. So if mm -hmm. you tell your child, well, you can't hang out with you know, Day Day, but Day Day is the protection for your child. Ah, you see what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. like a catch-22 kind of situation. So the, so the parents really don't know who to warn them against? They don't know what to do. Um, what, uh, mm. uh, oftentimes parents are if thinking... If you were in that situation, what would you, what would you, how would you deal with it? I, I would probably... Would you be one of these tough parents that... Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, of course you yeah, would, right? I've been that right. tough parent. <laughs> when my daughter would want to go <laughs> and hang out uh, in the housing developments 
and some of the same kinds of things existed, but not to the extent that we see them now. But why aren't the parents more tough? You I know, think I have that a lot they're of younger, grams all they're over overwhelmed, them. there okay. are uh, greater issues at hand, like uh, violence is not like how it used, it used to be, it would be, would occur every once in a while. Here, almost on a daily base, basis, you hear shooting in these housing developments. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more shooting as the years go by. Uh, okay. Just days before this takedown, I had a young person tell me that they were shooting in the, the grant. It was a grant. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were shooting in the grant, and uh, this person lived on the third floor in one of the buildings. And I said, what did you do? And she said, we got down on the floor. <laughs> young people should not have to know mm -hmm. to do that. At, at, at the age of 16, 17 years old. They should be having a good time hanging out in front of their building or in the playground or playing cards or you know doing things that young people do at that age. So it's, it's a really difficult situation. There's not one solution, there's not one answer. But what I do know that when uh, clergy, community leaders, parents, uh, business owners, come together to say we're not having this okay. and that they have to be all right with that not having it is going to mean that the ones who are creating the difficult situation mm -hmm. the violence uh, that are menacing to the community they have to go if the community is going to improve okay. they have to go there's no if ands or buts about it but mm -hmm. uh, again uh, like I did in the DNA info uh, article I caution uh, our district attorney Cy Vance and uh, NYPD, not to be overzealous and with this whole collateral damage thing. You know, they just say, oh, yeah. well, you know, there's always going to be collateral damage. Yes, there is. But it doesn't mean you just arrest a whole bunch of kids and, you know, and, so, and, and get them caught up in the system. So, so I, I, out, of I, the, out of these hundred or so, mm -hmm. you feel that maybe half of them shouldn't have been, been arrested? I'm not going to say that. I'm, and, and I'm going to tell well, you why. Well, even 20% of them shouldn't have maybe, been. Maybe 20%, okay. maybe not. But if you understand how gang violence has been going down in these housing developments, okay. and when you know how many people live in them. For example, right. one building, I think you alluded to this, Graham, that there's like maybe 1,500 people living in that one big, tall building. Yeah. So out of yeah, that, right. how many of those young people are teenagers? And right. then out of that percentage that are teenagers, how many of those young people are uh, affiliated with the gang mm. in that development? Because they have to so walk by each they other have to every walk, day. They're so affiliated they're mainly because they want in to be protected. Now, hmm. are they the ones who shoot and buy guns? Of I think course. that's a smaller <laughs> number. Ah. And so, but when they go after someone, they call in the troops. So they want large numbers. They want to look menacing. They want to be intimidating the whole nine. So everybody has to go out. And that's how you get the ones who are the wannabes, the ones who are just being provided with or serviced service mm -hmm. with protection. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that that's a place of intervention for uh, community-based organizations like Street Corner Resources, okay. which is the organization that I found, the other organizations, that's our place for intervention. Can we do it all? No. Community-based organizations need to receive the proper funding so that they can stay on the ground doing the work. Some of the organizations that get the funding never ever step foot in a housing development unless they have an office mm -hmm. there, they're in, they're out, they don't talk to these kids in the middle of the night, they don't move around the basketball courts trying to figure out what's going on. They are not talking to parents while their children are bleeding out in the hospital, losing life. Mm. They are not the ones that show up at schools uh, for the stead of the parent because the parent's mm. not showing up. We do that. We do that. Well, why don't and so you give we, we really plug. need these organizations uh, well, like Street Corner. You know, as we're both associated with National Action Network, you might give them the youth huddle that happens oh, every absolutely. Monday. The youth huddle is definitely a positive uh, National Action Network Youth Huddle is a positive Every place Monday. for young people to uh, get support, uh, mm -hmm. to engage other young people, to talk about different topics. It was topics. great Monday. Yeah, Monday it was, was absolutely, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, they talk about a variety of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Street Corner Resources led the uh, National Action Network Youth Huddle in what was called the Lion to lay down against uh, gun violence, mm -hmm. but to represent those who have gone on, uh, who lost their lives to gun violence. And it was very powerful, and young people are learning activism. They're learning how to use their voice. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that Street Corner Resources takes leadership in that. Uh, the other thing is, is that Street Corner Resources provides workshops in public schools for mm -hmm. both parents, teachers, and uh, the students themselves. 
uh, in ways to like deal with gun violence? Where are the resources? How do they protect themselves? How do they stay engaged? And we provide those kinds of solutions mm -hmm. for our young people. <coughs> Hopefully, we'll show a phone number and uh, folks will sure know how. Let me know before. Yeah, what's the yeah. number? Uh, yeah. It's 646-377-8904. Okay. 646-377-8904. Well, it has that right underneath your name. It's if you okay. Had Next time. I will. 8904 Right. 646. 377 This is a wonderful show, though. Right. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's re Can you uh, uh, run the rest of that clip on, uh, from, from the channel? F I forget what channel. Channel 5. Whatever we were running, I channel just five. ran it channel midway. Five. Do you have an opportunity to rerun the rest of that? Uh, a wild takedown. Give, give us an idea. Do you know the gangs, their names? We've heard of the Crips, the Bloods, but uh, uh, are they that? Can you can you take us through that a little bit? Do you know the gang names? Well, Greg, this is the thing. They, they've changed. They're called crews now because they're, they're much more localized, and many of them are localized in the housing developments themselves. And in the grant houses, it was the Stack 3 uh, crew or Stack 3 gang. That's what they called themselves. There are two other ones um, from this particular project, Manhattanville. They were affiliated with each other. And what they do is they each have their own little turf. And then if there's a bigger, a bigger problem facing them, like a bunch of them are in prison or in jail on Rikers Island, they'll form what they call affiliates and they'll unite with each other against others so the traditional gangs that we've heard about in the past like the bloods and the crips are not really what the authorities are seeing here operating on the streets of new york city they're much more localized they post these videos online they make a name for themselves and then they go to war with other people sometimes investigators are telling me for no reason at all this is the other thing that's different about this gang activity that they've been really working to get a handle on since 2010 where as the, the gangs of old were organized around specific trades like drug dealing, like prostitution, that type of thing. Sometimes these gang members, they just start beef with other gang members, um, have shootouts, and end up killing people for no particular reason at all. And, and very young ages, too, some of them, uh, as young as 13 and 14. So that's a concern. The police department wants to get a handle on this, especially as the summer is beginning. Greg? Yeah. Right. The, Lisa, thank you. All right, you see what I mean? Uh, these beefs are about nothing. Exactly. And um, everybody better pay, pay attention to this, especially in these two housing. Now, you have to realize what Graham laid out is a reality. You know, that's a prime territory, and they're looking to get rid of everybody. And this, this, these buildings are looking to be sold. Look how beautiful they are. You saw the outside. The inside can be re rehabbed, and all you do is get rid of the people. So people are looking for housing. So all you parents out there that know something's going on, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, never mind the snitch business that seems to be so prevalent in all these gangs and stuff. You better take care of yourself and your own housing or you'll be in the street. You hear me? Now that's it's, one thing that you, that will make you be, become a tougher parent. And, and they can report uh, the kind of activity that's, that's been going on in hallways. You know, the elders are afraid to go out to the supermarkets, uh, don't go out and sit on the benches anymore all because there's all kinds of gang activity yeah. in the hallways yeah. and on stop. the staircases. And that can be reported. It should be reported. Sure. We should not have our elders, you know, some people get upset and they say, oh, well, you have people telling on each other. Well, you know what? Then don't live there doing those kinds of things that make our elders feel like they can't move around in their community. Okay. That's punk stuff. The, That's the, what we The lack of respect, as. you know, back in the day, you didn't mess with old people. Exactly. You didn't That's mess right. with women. That's you right. didn't mess with kids. If That's you were right. a thug, you manned up and you dealt with another guy as exactly. big as you. Yeah, sure. These punk, so I can't say the words here, but the, the thing is, snitches sure. are only people that are involved in the criminal activity giving information up on the other cohort in the crime. Mm -hmm. A sane, civilized human being living who is a victim of this element, if you fail to make a phone call, it's on you. If you fail to make a phone call, you're jeopardizing your own child. Mm. Right. And no parent is due any respect when they will not put the welfare of their child first and foremost, even above their own welfare. Mm -hmm. I would never allow someone to even come near my child with drugs or anything like that. Personally, you're done.
I'd have been in prison if anybody tried to sell drugs to my kids when they were growing up. Mm. Because I'm not going to allow you to jeopardize my child's life. For that, I would be willing to go to prison. Yeah. You don't have to think like me, but you need to protect your child. Absolutely. Pick up the phone. You don't have to leave your name. You can go to the library. Send an email from the library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't have to use your, your, your computer in the IP house. Address, right? You can call from a pay phone. Mm -hmm. There is no excuse. And you can also send an email to the police commissioner, mm -hmm. nypd.org. You can send it to the commissioner's office, all right? Mm -hmm. And you keep a copy of your email. And you send that email copy to elected officials and let them know. Because if you don't start seeing a change in your community, then certain leadership has to be changed in oh, absolutely. the city. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, Aisha, give us a well, clue of what we can do to help you in the future. Okay, well, in the future, one, uh, to help the organizations, yeah. you can call your elected officials. Okay. Like I said, there have been organizations like Street Corner Resources okay. that receives very minimal funding, so we're not able to hire the kind of staff to continue the great work that we've been doing. But they, they honor the work, We've gotten tons of awards and everything. I mean, yeah, like, that I, I have bills. an office. It, it does not pay the bills, nor does it make it so that uh, we can hire. Actually, we've had other city agencies, including the district attorney's office, that have hired people from our organization because we have not been able to keep them and hire them. So I would say fund organizations that are on the ground doing, doing the real work in the community and that have credibility with these young people so that we can make change real change in our community. The other thing is, is that parents and clergy must get involved and support mm. the people who are doing the work. You can bolster the work, improve on the work, become a body with the organization that can help to provide service in the community. They're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for people with ex expertise uh, in a lot of different areas, including research and uh, the ability to do administrative work. All of those things. So we ask parents to get involved. If you are where your young person is, they're more likely to be successful. Mm. And uh -huh. if they see that you're involved, then they emulate what they see. Right. The other thing is, is parents have to definitely get into the rooms of their young people. Yeah. Go in those okay. rooms. Don't be afraid to go through the closet, the dresser drawers, coat pockets, under the bed, behind the bed, on the uh, windowsill where the curtains sit in the same right. place, All and right. make sure that there's no weapon there. 15 and uh, don't feel dumb if you don't, th don't know what to do. Just exactly. ask questions. That's right. All right. We all are overwhelmed sometimes, especially when it comes to your child, and you feel that you don't know what to do but pray half the time. But the God in me loves the God in you, and thank you for coming to the Gilchrist Experience. God bless. Thank you. Wonderful show. All right.